<clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Keys to the Kingdom. I'm Marissa, and um, glad to be here today, even though um, we weren't able to do a video last week because of Thanksgiving. I hope you all had a nice Thanksgiving, hopefully uh, with your family, maybe, maybe not so much because of the pandemic. But um, so that's why we didn't have a video last week, but um, and we didn't have one yesterday. I've been feeling a little bit under the weather, so um, you know, I, <clears throat> I'm having trouble with my sinuses and, and stuff like that because the weather's been changing and it's cold now. So hey, Jessica, so glad you can make it, sweetie. Welcome. Uh, so I wasn't able to do a video yesterday, and I've just been waiting for, you know, to feel better because I didn't want to be blowing my nose every five minutes while I'm on the video. So that's why, please, please forgive me for, for, uh, for not being able to make it yesterday. But finally, we're going to get to the rest of our Bible study, which is, um, we're still in Genesis. We're still in the book of Genesis. Um, before we do that, I do have a couple of things that I wanted to mention. Um, <clears throat> we still have, um, we still have, um, the, the tank tops that are available, the kingdom ready. I don't know if you can see them, but the, the, the kingdom ready tank tops, we are, um, we are selling these kingdom ready tank tops to support uh, two ministries. I actually support two ministries. One of the ministries is in Africa and the other, the other ministry is in, um, in Pakistan. And they actually had to migrate out of Pakistan to Malaysia because they're under a lot of persecution in Pakistan, um, because it's a predominantly Muslim country. Um, and they are not only believers in Yeshua being the Messiah, so they preach his name, but they also follow all of the, the feast days and they, they teach a lot of Hebrew. So they're very much persecuted over there in Pakistan. So they had to move to Malaysia and they're trying to, um, they're trying to get a passage to, to migrate to Canada. So we're trying to help them out with that. And so we're selling these, uh, kingdom ready tank tops. I don't know if you've seen them. You can see them on the page. It's at the very top of the page, pinned to the very top of the page. Uh, it's kingdom ready, and on the back it says keys to the kingdom, Matthew 16, 19. And we're selling them. They're $35 uh, for a donation of $35 for these two congregations. And we just want to um, we want to help them out because it's it's it was already hard for them prior to COVID, but now because of COVID, things are even harder. And mind you, these, these congregations, they're literally just needing like food and medical supplies. And when I say food, that's like a bag of corn flour or a bag of rice and maybe some vegetables. Um, the one in Africa, they deal with a lot of malaria, so they need a lot of medical supplies. And my husband and I try to, to help them out as much as we can because, uh, they are supporting the poor, the widow, and the orphan, and they're teaching them the word of God. I mean, they're, they're very serious about teaching the word of God and spreading the word in their country, even though it's not accepted there. It's very much not accept, accepted there. Hey, Christine, so glad you can make it. I'm so glad, um, I'm so glad you like your tank top. Glad, thank you for helping support um, these two ministries because um, the teachers are very wonderful. Um, God loving people and they teach the truth and they have such a huge heart. Like it's easy for me or you to give, like to give money. It doesn't really take much. It just takes us, you know, giving money. They're actually doing the work. Like, I don't know, like I could, I, I could never do that job. The work that they're doing with, <clears throat> you have to imagine like, you know, several hundred, well, there's, there's about a hundred something children that they're, that they're parenting. I mean, they're parenting these children because they're orphans. 
and they're trying to teach them the word of God, and they're trying to deal with any sicknesses and diseases that are over there, and they're trying to deal with any persecution in their country for their religion. And I don't, I mean, and they're always happy. They're always smiling. It's just, it's really unbelievable. And so for me or you to give to these congregations is, is, is like very easy because honestly, like I, I, that for me, that doesn't even compare to the work that they're doing for these kids. And they're also taking care of the elderly too. So they're, you know, any of the, um, the widows, oh, there's a lot of, there's quite a few widows. They take care of them as well. They make sure they have their medications and um, they just, you know, and they're always happy. It's, it's really remarkable. We just don't see a lot of that here in America. So um, <clears throat> in addition to the tank tops, yes, the tank tops are for um, supporting those congregations, but I've I finally just said, you know, even though I couldn't get them engraved, I just said, we'll just, we'll just do, we'll just do a necklace with a key. So it's for the keys to the kingdom page. It's a necklace just like this. And it has a key. It'll be one of these three keys here. Um, one of these three keys. Um, so the necklace with the key is $12 for a donation of $12. We'll go to one of these congregations and like I said, it's just like every little bit helps. And for them, when funds come in from America and they convert it over to their currency, that helps a little bit as well, because obviously they're going to uh, monetize a lot more on the American dollar just because of the exchange rate. So that helps them out as well. So every little bit helps. And I appreciate and thank all of you who have already um given a donation for the tank top or the key because uh, it, it has really helped them. And there are always, I can, I can if you would like, uh, let me know and I can actually give you the link to their, their pages if you ever want to keep up with um, what's going on in, with their congregation. They are always posting updates and um, <clears throat> they're, they're spreading the word, like they're spreading the gospel and they have nothing. They have nothing. And they have, all they have is the word of God and each other and the little bit of money that comes in to help them. And they're like under persecution and fighting diseases and they're always happy. It's, it's really unbelievable. So thank you to everybody who has, who has already done that. I, I really do. Um, thank you and appreciate you. And I can tell you right now that, um, uh, Pastor Ivan, who is over the African congregation, and um, Shahid, who is over the um, the one in Pakistan, has said thank you very much as well because um, they're, they're just they're always very thankful and very grateful, and they never ask for anything until they have never asked for anything until all of this happened with COVID, and then it was almost like they had no choice. Like they had to reach out and ask people, we don't have any choice. Like we, we're, it was already hard enough. And now with COVID, everything's gotten worse. So, um, they do say thank you, um, for, for helping to support them. Um, so today, um, we have quite a, we have quite a bit of scriptures to get through. And <laughs> these scriptures are just a, there's a lot in them, um, but I just wanted to mention that I'm kind of, I'm going to be reading out of, I got this new Bible, and the reason I got it is because of the type of Bible that it is. It's the Archaeology Study Bible. I don't know if any of you have ever seen this. Uh, it's the Archaeology Study Bible. This is it here, and you can get it online. I, um, I'm a nerd. And I like to know information. So I really, I really like it because it lines up everything archaeology wise and all of the findings and all of the history um, <clears throat> having to do with the Bible and having to do with the cultures around the Bible. So it helps you like as you're following to see the notes at the bottom or to see the map or to see the archaeology finds along the way as you're reading the Bible. So um, I'm going to be reading out of that today because there's a few notes that I want to be able to just kind of glean from that are in this book. 
And so um, that's um, that's what we're going to do today because I, I just I like a little bit of extra information. Christine says these types of places is where we are meant to tithe in my understanding. Yes, I mean, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I've always, you know, there's always that debate of like, are we supposed to tithe because there's no longer a temple and we no longer have the, the priestly services and all of that? Okay, whatever. But you you could you could argue and say that we're not we don't have the the actual system set up with the with the temple and the and the and the levites and the priestly system but that doesn't that doesn't stop us from giving like we're still commanded to give and help the poor the widow and the orphans so whether you call that a tithe or whether you call that um you know just giving or 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 charity or however you want to do it but yeah like i think these are the type, you're right, Christine, these are the type of places that, that I want to be giving to. I have always given to congregations that I'm a part of because I just feel like if I'm going to be a part of a congregation and they are doing all the work and they're putting in the time, I've always felt like, like that's my personal, that's just my personal feeling is that if I'm there, I'm going to help support them. But because I'm not um, anymore that uh, giving to these places I feel like is, uh, who, who really does need it the most? And they're doing an amazing job. It's, it's really unbelievable. Raheem and Gina. Gina says Shabbat Shalom. I love how you say Shabbat Shalom. Um, even though it's Sunday, because I still, I, I miss our Shabbats. And I'm, and I'm really trying to keep with my, uh, my appointed, um, date and time that we're supposed to do our video, but sometimes it just doesn't work out that way. And I don't know what's been going on these past few weeks, but I've noticed that, um, there's been a lot of distractions. So, but I want to, I really want to make sure that we don't get off course. Um, I decided to stop our, um, book of Jasher reading because I felt like maybe it was overwhelming people. Um, I don't want anyone to get overwhelmed because, um, um, <clears throat> I don't want anyone to get overwhelmed because we're, we're trying to get through the Bible. And so let's just focus on this first and then maybe we'll get to something else. Um, you know what I mean? Gina says, I like to give where I am fed the word. Gina, you are, you are amazing. That's, that's just very sweet of you to say. And, um. Rahim says it's okay. God is still in control. Yes, God is, God is still in control. So <clears throat> I'm going to do my best to keep a good date and time, but if not, I'll do it when I can do it. So that's all we can do. We can only do what we can do. Okay. Um, so this is going to be interesting. This, uh, 20, Genesis 28, 10 through 36. This is what we're reading from today. And there's a lot here. And this is kind of a pivotal, this is kind of a pivotal time in the Bible because a lot of things stem from what happens in these pages. So, you know, like I said, Genesis is the seed of everything flourishing after Genesis. Everything after Genesis is a is a growth and blossoming of the seed which is in Genesis because this is where it all started. So let's go ahead and get started um, in Genesis 28 verse 10. So <clears throat> Jacob had just left his household because he well, his brother Esau wanted to kill him because he not only tricked him into giving him his birthright, but he also tricked his father into giving him his blessing. So his brother wanted to kill him, so his mother sent him off to go find a wife amongst her relatives. And so he leaves his household, and this is what transpires um, during that time. So Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Uh, taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and laid down in that place to sleep. 
and he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set upon the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending upon it. And the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord your God, the God of Abraham your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your offspring, and your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So you see, <clears throat> God is repeating to him what he said to Isaac and what he said to Abraham. He is repeating this covenant that he has made. Rahim is taking notes. Good job, girl. Take, take some notes. Taking notes helps. It, do, it, it helps you retain for some reason. Um... So he's repeating this covenant back to Jacob. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. This is God speaking to Jacob here. I will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I promised. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. Surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. So what we can glean from <clears throat> Jacob's entire life is that up to this point, Jacob knew of God, but De Jacob had not yet had a personal relationship or a personal encounter with God. And I believe that there's a lot of believers who believe in God because they know about God. They've read the Bible but they have not experienced him. And there's a difference between knowing about God and knowing God, having a relationship with God and just having the knowledge of the Bible and your belief system set up. And so we see here that God is in, like Jacob is encountering God on a spiritual level, on a supernatural level that you can't, you cannot gain unless the grace of God um, <clears throat> decides to, to come to you and speak to you. Um, until you experience God, it's a whole, it's, it, you're, you really don't know God. You just know of God. So up to this point, Jacob knew of God, but he didn't have a personal relationship with him. So, so God has to reintroduce himself to the next generation because otherwise they're just they just have head knowledge and not personal relationship knowledge with the Lord. Does that make sense? <clears throat> it's like you can raise your children in a congregation, you know, go I mean they can know the Bible backwards and forwards, but unless your children have an experience with God, and try to um, cultivate a relation, an actual tangible relationship with God. Um, it's again, it's going to be that um, that head knowledge of knowing God, but n knowing of God, but not really knowing God personally. And there's a huge difference. So up to this point, Jacob had not experienced God on a personal level. <clears throat> So God is making a promise to him and he wakes up and he says, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. So down here in the little notes in my, in my new Bible, it says that ladder, the word ladder stems from the Hebrew word salal meaning to cast up a mound, perhaps related to the Akkadian word simultu, meaning steps, and the picture of a series of steps leading to an entrance or gateway into heaven. So Jacob says right here, this is the gate of heaven. 
And the idea of a gate to the entrance to heaven was a common motif in the ancient Near Eastern literature. For instance, the high priest of Thebes in Egypt was called the opener of the gates of heaven. The Egyptians believed there were gates to the east that opened into the field of paradise. So this was even a belief amongst all these surrounding, surrounding countries. Egypt believed that there were gates to the east that opened into the fields of paradise. The Sumerians understood the abode of the dead to be guarded by a gate. You could almost say like a portal, almost. A spiritual portal type of, type of gate. So early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and set up for a pillar and poured oil on it, on the top of it. <clears throat> he called it the name of that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Loose at first. So the name of the city was Loose, and now it's Bethel. Bethel means the house of God. <clears throat> it's actually Beit El. Beit meaning house, El meaning God. Then Jacob made a vow saying, so this was his vow to God. And this is important because God is going to keep this vow. If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I have set up for a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. So this is interesting because Jacob is saying, if you provide for me <clears throat> and you give me food and clothing and that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And of all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. So here we go with the tenth again. Oh, Christine said Stargate. That's another word. You could say Stargate, yes. Um, that's that's been said that there's it's been said that there's different places all over the planet. Certain areas are <clears throat> almost like portals into heaven. But you see here, like Abraham gave a tenth to Melchizedek, who was the king kingly priest. And you see Jacob here saying that he will give God a full tenth as well. So um, the tithe, the tenth, the tenth of your belongings didn't start with the Torah. Most people think it, be, it was only with the um, the giving of the Torah and the laws of the Torah that the uh, the giving a tenth of your <clears throat> of your crop and your belongings back to God. But it actually started, it started in the beginning. It started with, um, it started with Cain and Abel because they both gave offerings to God and one pleased God and the other one did not. So chapter 29, then Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. And he looked and he saw a well in the field and behold, three flocks of sheep lying beside it. For out of that well, the flocks were watered. The stone on the well's mouth was large. And when all the flocks were gathered there, the shepherds would roll the stone from the mouth of the well and water the sheep and put the stone back in its place over the mouth of the well. Jacob said to them, my brothers, where do you come from? They said, we are from Haran. He said to them, do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? <clears throat> now I'm going to stop there for just a second because just remember that even though this is Rebecca's family, they all still come from idolatry, paganism. They come from this worldly system of idolatry that has been set up. It is only Abraham and his household through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that know about God and his laws. So... <clears throat> He's traveling to Haran, but he's still going to a household that still doesn't know the God 
the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. They still don't know him and they still have practices. They're very much still in idolatry. Um, he said to them, do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? They said, we know him. He said to them, is it well with him? They said, it is well. And see, Rachel, his daughter, is coming with the sheep. And he said, behold, it is still high day. It is not time for the livestock to be gathered together. <clears throat> Water the sheep and go pasture them. But they said, we cannot until the flocks are gathered together and the stone is rolled from the mouth of the well, then we water the sheep. While he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a sheep herdess. <clears throat> now as soon as Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, Jacob came near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and wept out loud. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's kinsman and that he was Rebekah's son. And she ran and told her father. <clears throat> so immediately he kisses Rachel and he weeps out loud fell in love at first sight, I suppose. As soon as Laban heard the news about Jacob, his sister's son, he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. <clears throat> Jacob told Laban all these things, and Laban said to him, Surely you are, bone of, are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him a month. So Jacob stays with Laban for one month. Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall be your wages? So you're going to work with me, you're going to help me till the fields, you're going to help me plow, you're going to help me, <coughs> excuse me, however he was going to help. He was like, should you serve me for nothing? What, 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 name, name it, what will your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. Jacob loved Rachel, and he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. <clears throat> and I want to point out right here that Isaac was the youngest. Jacob was the second, was also the second born. And so Jacob is now wanting to marry the second born of Laban's daughters. Because it seems so far God has favored <clears throat> the second born. So Jacob is probably, first of all, First of all, Rachel is the first one that he saw. So he, he falls in love with Rachel immediately. He's not thinking about the, uh, the older daughter, but he's also um, probably very attracted to her because it, the Bible mentions the appearance. <clears throat> so there seems to be a difference. But she's also the younger of the two, and he probably feels like... Um, I don't know, maybe like a little bit of connection with the younger because he is also the second born. I will serve seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than I should give her to any other man. So stay with me. So it appears that Laban is saying, okay, I would rather give her to you than to somebody else. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. So here Jacob has, um, <clears throat> as you can tell, he has fallen head over, here, head over heels for Rachel um, so much that the seven years was nothing to him because he, he just he was head over heels for her. 
And Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife that I may go into her, for my time is complete. And I think it's very interesting that it was seven years because seven is very significant to God. Seven is the number of completion. It is the number of perfection. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. Um, and there's a little note down here at the bottom because Jacob says, give me my wife that I might go into her. And most of you probably already know this, but Jacob calling Rachel his wife prior to the wedding was common practice because a betrothed woman was basically had the status of a wife. She was already considered a wife. Just like when Joseph was engaged to Mary, to Miriam, Jesus's, Yeshua's parents, um, <clears throat> well, Yeshua's mom. She was already considered to be betrothed to him. So once you were engaged, you were considered basically already married. They just had not had the celebration yet. <clears throat> so they made a feast, but in the evening he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob. And he went into her. Laban gave his female servant Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her servant. And just as a side note here, the provision of a maidservant for the bride by the bride's father is found in the Newsy tablets of the mid-second mid millennial B.C., there it was part of the wedding arrangement to demonstrate that the marriage was legally binding. So as soon as the woman was <clears throat> married, the father would give her a maidservant. And that was solidifying the, the wedding arrangement. I also want to point out here, um, <clears throat> because it is said that, because you're wondering, like, how did Jacob not know that it was Rachel. The father brings in Leah, and, Rachel, and, and, and Jacob seemingly has no idea. And in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Did I not serve you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? So there's a couple things that are going on here. First of all, Jacob is reaping a little bit of what he sowed because Jacob is the deceiver. He's the supplanter, such as his name connotates. His name signifies that he's kind of a trickster. Jacob's kind of a trickster. <clears throat> he tricked his brother into giving him his birthright. He tricked his father into giving him his brother's blessing. Um, so Jacob's kind of reaping what he's sowing here. Immediately, now he's the the one being tricked. Another thing I want to point out is it is said that it is very possible that, so remember Esau and Jacob are, are fraternal twins. And it is said that it's very possible that Leah and Rachel were fraternal twins as well. So that even though they looked a little bit different, they were still very, very similar in the way that they looked. So, and you have to understand that back in those days, there was no, there was no electricity. So you went in and it was dark. The women wore face coverings anyway, and they go in and they spend the night together, you know, unless they were having a lengthy conversation and she said, no, I'm Leah. Um, she, she would have never known. And it's very possible that Laban told, obviously he did, Laban had to have told Leah what he was going to do. <clears throat> because Jacob was planning on marrying Rachel, I'm pretty sure Laban was like, look, you know, this, this man is probably the best suitor that's going to, this is probably going to be the best suitor for you and your sister. Um, so why don't, why don't we kind of make this arrangement to where you're both, where you're marrying him first to make sure that you have a husband as well. So it is, it is very possible that Rachel and Leah were fraternal twins, just like Esau and Jacob. <clears throat> 
So he says, did I not serve you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, it is not so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. <clears throat> and that's true. That's um, recorded in a lot of... Um, in a lot of other cultures where it was it was always the firstborn female to be married off first and then they would go you know down the line complete this complete the week of this one and we will give you the other also in return for serving for me another 7 years <clears throat> so they have a week to celebrate the wedding. That's why he says, complete this week with her, and then I'll give you the other one. Because they had to spend this week together as um, husband and wife. And I'll give you the other one if you serve for me another 20, another, oh, sorry, another seven years. So you see here, Laban is very, um, strategic in what he's doing. He's getting both of his daughters married off to a man who has a lot of wealth, and he's getting this man to work for him double time. But I think it's interesting that he ends up having to work two seven-year periods because he tricked his brother twice. He got the blessing and he got the birthright. <clears throat> I just thought that was that was interesting side note. So Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Laban gave him his female servant Bilhah to his daughter Rachel to be her servant. So Jacob went into Rachel also and he loved Rachel more than Leah and served Laban for another seven years. <clears throat> Gina says Laban and his sister Rebecca were both deceivers. Well, kind of, because Rebecca's the one that told Jacob to do what he did. She's the one that said, let me put some fur on you and make you look like Esau. But I kind of, I almost side with Rebecca for doing that because she knew that her son Jacob was the more godly of the two and that Esau was very worldly and he was probably going to squander his inheritance. And when you have a child that you know is not going to, um, is not going to, um, you know, cherish what is given to them <clears throat> and do with it, um, and, you know, and, and handle it in the, in the proper manner, you you want to give those things to the other child. So I kind of side with Rebecca for doing that. But yeah, since Rebecca and Laban are brother and sister, I guess it runs in the family. Okay, so he serves Laban for another seven years. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated and that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So here we go again. We had Sarah that was barren, could not have kids. God gives her a promise. She ends up having kids way into her old age. Then we have Rebecca. She can't have kids, but Isaac prayed for Rebecca, and God opens her womb, and she's able to have children. And now we see Rachel is now barren, but it seems like it's for a different reason. It's because God wants to... Um, for Leah to find favor in Jacob's eyes because she is not loved in this relationship. And it's not her fault that her dad decided to marry both of her both of his daughters to the same man. So Leah conceives and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, for now my husband will love me. She conceived again and bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I am hated, he has given me this son also. She called his name Simon or Simeon. Again, she conceived and bore a son and said, now this time my husband will be attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore, his name is called Levi. 
<clears throat> and she conceived again and bore a son. She's just popping out boy after boy. Fourth son. And said, this time I will praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah, your Yehuda. Then she ceased bearing kids. When Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister. So now jealousy is taking root in, in, in Rachel. And she said to Jacob, give me children or I shall die. Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel. And he said, am I in the place of God who has withheld you from the fruit of your womb? Then she said, here is my servant Bilhah, go into her so that she may give birth on my behalf, that I may have children through her. <clears throat> and on a side note here, this giving birth on my behalf, it says, the text literally says, give birth on my knees. The act of placing a newborn on someone's knees was well known practice in the ancient Near East, signifying legitimization and perhaps even adoption so when she said let her have um let me give birth on my knees or let her give birth on my behalf the custom was this woman was going to give birth and she was going to adopt this child as her own She gave him her servant, Bilhah, as a wife. And as another side note, it was common in the ancient Near East to provide a new wife for the, if the first wife was barren. In the Newsy text, for instance, the majority of texts on marriage deal with childless and provisions, childlessness and provisions for a new wife. <clears throat> so it was common practice if, if a woman was barren to give another wife in her place so that she could have children. And Bilhah conceived and bore a son to Jacob. Then Rachel said, God has judged me and has also heard my voice and given me a son. <clears throat> Therefore, she called his name Dan. Rachel's servant Bilhah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, with mighty wrestling, I have wrestled with my sister and I have prevailed. So she called his name Naphtali. When Leah saw that she had ceased bearing children, she took her servant Zilpah and gave her to Jacob as a wife. Things are getting a little messy. So now we have four wives and all these kids. This is some serious dysfunction. <coughs> Then Leah's servant Zilpah bore a son to Jacob, and Leah said, Good fortune has come, and she called his name Gad. Leah's servant Zilpah bore Jacob a second son. And Leah said, Happy am I, for women have called me happy. So she called his name Asher, because the name Asher means happy. In the days of the wheat harvest, Reuben went and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, is it a small matter that you have taken away my husband? Would you take away my son's mandrakes also? So clearly there is just no talking between these two. There's a very big feud. <clears throat> Rachel said, then he may lie with you tonight in exchange for your son's mandrakes. So he may be with you tonight. He may sleep with you tonight and lie with you tonight if you give me some of your son's mandrakes. When Jacob came from the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, You must come in to me, for I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. So apparently the only way she could get <coughs> Jacob to come sleep with her was through bribery, um, or just to have a child. For I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. 
So he lay with her that night and God listened to Leah and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. Leah said, God has given me my wages because I gave my servant to my husband. So she called his name Issachar. So as a side note, the reason that Rachel wanted the mandrakes is because mandrakes were considered an aphrodisiac in the Near East. And it was thought that it would um, make you fertile and you would have children. You would, you would become more fertile by eating these mandrakes. So that's why Rachel wanted the mandrakes. <clears throat> and Leah conceived again and she bore Jacob a sixth son. So Rachel, in trying to get the mandrakes so that she could become, become pregnant, gives her husband, well, their husband, to Leah, and she conceives two times. Then Leah said, God has endowed me with a good endowment, and now my husband will honor me because I have borne him six sons, and she named his and she named his, and she called his name Zebulun. Afterwards, she bore a daughter, and her name was Dinah. So Dinah was the daughter that was through Leah. <clears throat> and we'll see more about Dinah later on. Then God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her and opened her womb. And she conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph, saying, May the Lord add to me another son. So now Jacob is born. As soon as Rachel had born Joseph, <clears throat> Jacob said to Laban, Send me away that I may go to my home country. Give me my wages and my children for whom I have served you. That I may go, for you know that the service, you know the service I have given you. And that I may go for, I'm sorry, give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you. And it says here, <clears throat> it says here down at the bottom, when he said, give me my wives and my children so that I may go. Throughout the ancient Near East, it is clear in the Newsy documents, children born in servitude belonged to the master and not the servant. And we see that a lot throughout history with whenever there was any type of servitude, um, that the children belonged to the master. So any children that were born uh, in slavery belonged to the master and not actually to the person. But Laban said to him, if I have found favor in your sight, I have learned by divination, I have learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. So here is Laban confessing that he, he knows that the Lord has blessed him because of Jacob because he practices divination. Name your wages and I will give it to you. Jacob said to him, you yourself know how I have served you. And how your livestock have fared with me. For you had little before I came. And it has increased abundantly. And the Lord has blessed you wherever I turned. But now when I shall provide for my own. But now when shall I provide for my own household also? He's saying how much longer do I have to serve you? Before I can provide for my own family. He said what shall I give you? Jacob said, you shall not give me anything. If you will do this for me, I will again pass through your flock and keep it. Let me pass through all your flock today, removing from it every speckled and spotted sheep and every black lamb. <clears throat> and the speckled and, speckled and spotted among the goats, and they shall be my wages. So my honesty will answer for me later when you come to look into my wages with you. Every one that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and black among the lambs, if found with me, shall be counted as stolen. Laban said, Good, let it be as you have said. <clears throat> so basically, hold on. So 
So basically, Jacob is saying, He's going to remove every speckled and spotted sheep and every black lamb. And those are going to be Jacob's wages. So basically Laban's going to be left with all of the white sheep and all of the, all of the flocks that do not have spots or speckles on them. <clears throat> but the day Laban removed the male goats... I'm sorry, but that day Laban removed the male goats that were striped and spotted and all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, every one that had white on it and every lamb that was black and put them in charge of his sons. And he set a distance of three days journey between himself and Jacob and Jacob pastured the rest of Laban's flock. Then Jacob took fresh sticks. This has always been... Very interesting and kind of weird at the same time. <clears throat> but Jacob takes fresh sticks of poplar and almond and plane trees and peeled white streaks on them, and peeled white streaks on them, exposing the white of the sticks. He set the sticks that he had peeled in front of the flocks in the troughs. That is the watering place where the flocks come to drink. And since they bred, when they, apparently they breed when they go to drink. The flocks bred in front of the sticks, and so the flocks brought forth striped, speckled, and spotted. Somehow Jacob was able to manipulate the situation, and God was obviously with him, because this all turned out in his favor. But however, whatever he did caused them to <clears throat> mate in front of these sticks and produce striped, speckled, and spotted. And Jacob separated the lambs and set the faces of the flocks towards the striped and all the black in the flock of Laban. He put his own droves apart and did not put them with Laban's flock. Wherever the stronger of the flocks were breeding... Jacob would lay the sticks in the troughs before the eyes of the flock that they might breed among the sticks. But for the feebler of the flock, he would not lay them there. So the feebler would be Laban's and the stronger would be Jacob's. So Jacob was getting the strongest of the flock and Laban was getting the lamer, the weaker of the flocks. <clears throat> Thus the man increased greatly and had large flocks, female servants and male servants, and camel donkeys. So we can see here, because remember what Jacob said to God. He said, if you will provide for me, give me food and clothing, and be with me that I come back to my home in peace, then I will serve you. And he is prospering here. He is prospering in the job that he has been given. And God is keeping his promise. He made a covenant with God. When you make a covenant with God, you keep your end. God will keep his promises as well. So chapter 31. Now Jacob heard that the sons of Laban were saying, Jacob has taken all that was our father's, and from what was our father's, he has gained all this wealth. And Jacob saw that Laban did not regard him with favor as before. So Laban's not happy that Jacob's prospering. Then the Lord said to Jacob, now God is speaking to Jacob, return to the land of your fathers and your kindred, and I will be with you. Don't worry, I'm going to be with you. <clears throat> now that I've prospered you, you see, God has always made a covenant, brought them into a place that they would pro uh, that they had the ability to prosper, and then is going to take them back to where He wants them to be. So Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah into the field where his flock was, and said to them, <clears throat> "I see that your father does not regard me with favor as he did before." 
but the God of my father has been with me. You know that I have served your father with all my strength. Yet your, your father has cheated me and changed my wages ten times. But God did not permit him to harm me. If he said the spotted shall be your wages, then all the flocks bore spotted. And if he said the striped shall be your wages, then all the flock bore striped. So this was frustrating Laban because Laban would say, you're going to get all the speckled, but everything else is mine. And then all of a sudden all the flocks would start breeding speckled in Jacob's favor. And Laban wasn't too happy about this, even though he knew that God was with him. Because remember, he practiced divination to find out that the Lord was with him. And that the reason that he was prospering was because of Jacob. <clears throat> Thus God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. In the breeding season of the flock, I lifted up my eyes and saw in a dream that the goats that mated with the flock were striped, spotted, and modded, mottled. Then the angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, and I said, here I am. And he said, lift up your eyes and see. All the goats that mate with the flock are striped, spotted, and mottled. For I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. So God spoke to him in a dream again. For I see all that God that Laban is doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar and made a vow to me. Now arise and go out from this land and return to the land of your kindred. Then Rachel and Leah answered and said to him, so he's telling this to his, his wives. He's telling this to Rachel and Leah. <clears throat> what has God told him? And now what he's telling him to go and do. Then Rachel and Leah answered and said to him, Is there any portion or inheritance left to us in our father's household? Are we not regarded by him as are we are we not regarded by him as foreigners? For he has sold us, and he has indeed devoured our money. All the wealth that God has taken away from our father belongs to us and to our children. Now then, whatever God has said to do, do. So Jacob arose and set his sons and his wives on camels. <clears throat> and he drove away all his livestock, all his property that he had gained, and the livestock in his, in his possession that he had acquired in Padam Haran, and to go to the land of Canaan to his father Isaac. Laban had gone to shear his sheep, and Rachel stole her father's household gods. <clears throat> So Laban went, goes to shear his sheep and Rachel goes in to steal her father's household gods. Because remember, there's still an idolatry and they still practice divination and they do not worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But why did Rachel steal her father's household gods? One of the purposes of these idols was to obtain oracles. It may be that Rachel stole them to prevent Laban from using them to divine Jacob's route of escape. In addition, possession of family gods symbolized title to the family property in the ancient, ancient Near East. So Rachel may have stolen them to safeguard, safeguard her inheritance rights. Because if you just heard what her and Leah said, they're saying, Haven't, hasn't our father given us anything? <clears throat> like it seemed like their father, weren't, what, they, he wasn't going to give his daughters in, 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 in any inheritance. That he had basically just sold them. Sold them to Jacob. For his labor and such. So she took them. Um, because like I said, it's, it's, um, <clears throat> it symbolized the title to the family property, having those household gods. And they were also used in the product, in the process of divination and, 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 and oracle working and stuff like that.
So she takes the household gods, and Jacob tricked Laban, the Armenian, by not telling him that he intended to flee. He fled with all that he had and arose and crossed the Euphrates, and he set his face towards the hill country of Gilead. So now Laban is taking his family, and he's out of there. He's leaving. When it was told to Laban on the third day that Jacob had fled, he took his kinsmen with him and pursued him for seven days and followed close after him into the hill country of Gilead. But God came to Laban. God came to Laban, the Armenian, in a dream by night and said to him, Be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. And Laban overtook Jacob, and now so now he comes up to Jacob, and he, he is now approaching him. And Jacob had pitched his tent in the hill country, and Laban, with his kinsmen, pitched tents in the hill country of Gilead. And Laban said to Jacob, What have you done, that you have tricked me and driven away my daughters like captives to the, of the sword? <clears throat> Why did you flee in, so secretly and trick me? And did not tell me, so that I might send you away with mirth and songs and with tambourines. Why didn't you tell me so I can send you away with a going away party? Yeah, sure. Like, that was your intentions. And why did you not permit me, permit me to kiss my sons and my daughters farewell? Now you have done foolishly. It is in my power to do you harm. But the God of your father spoke to me last night saying, be careful not to say anything to Jacob. So he's actually telling him what God told him. Neither good or bad. And now you have gone away because you longed greatly for your father's house. But why did you steal my gods? Why did you steal my household gods? Jacob answered and said to Laban, <clears throat> because I was afraid, for I thought that you would take your daughters from me by force. Anyone with whom you find your gods shall not live. So Jacob doesn't know that Rachel took the gods. Anyone whom you find with your gods, they shall not live. In the presence of our kinsmen, point out what I have that is yours and take it. Now Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them. So he says, go ahead and look for it. If you find it, they will we'll kill him. So Laban went into Jacob's tent and into Leah's tent and into the tent of the two female servants, but he did not find them. And he went out of Leah's tent <coughs> and entered Rachel's. Now Rachel had taken the household gods and put them in the camel's saddle, and she sat on them. Laban felt all about the tent, but did not find them. And she said to her father, Let not my Lord be angry that I cannot rise before you. In other words, I can't get up from this camel saddle. That I cannot rise before you, for the way of women is upon me. In other words, she was saying, I can't get up from this seat. Please forgive me, because I'm on my period, basically. Um... I'm on my period, so I don't want to get up from the seat right now. The way of women is upon me. <laughs> so he searched, but did not find the household gods. <clears throat> then Jacob became angry and berated Laban. Jacob said to Laban, what is my offense? What is my sin that you have hotly pursued me? For you have felt through all my goods, and what have you found? of all your household goods. Set it here before my kinsmen and your kinsmen that they may decide between the two of us. These 20 years I have been with you. Your ooze and your female goats have not miscarried and I have not eaten of the rams of your flocks. What was torn by wild beasts I did not bring to you. I bore the loss of it myself. <clears throat> From my hand you required it, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. There I was by day, the heat consumed me, and the cold by night, and my sleep fled before my eyes. These twenty years I have been in your house, I served you fourteen years for your two daughters, and six years for your flock, and you have changed my wages ten times. So Jacob's had enough. He's like, look, this is what you've done to me, and these have been my situations. He's like, what's your beef? 
If the God of my father, the God of Abraham and my and the fear of Isaac had not been on my side, surely now you would have sent me away empty handed. He's like, if it hadn't been for God, I probably would be broke by now and you would probably have sent me away with nothing. <clears throat> God saw my affliction in the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. Then Laban answered and said to Jacob, the daughters are my daughters and the children are my children. The flocks are my flocks and all that you see is mine. <clears throat> but what can I do this day for these, for these my daughters or for their children whom they have born? Come now, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. And Jacob said to his kinsmen, gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap, a pile of stones. And they ate there by the heap. Jacob called it Jagardath Dutha. I have no idea how to say that. But Jacob called, Laban called it that. Laban called it Jagardath Dutha. And Jacob called it Galid. Laban said, this heap is a witness between you and me today. Therefore, his, he named it Galid and Mitzpah. For he said, the Lord watched between you and me. And when we are out of one another's sight, if you oppress my daughters or if you take wives besides my daughters, although no one is with us, God is a witness between you and me. Then Laban said to Jacob, See this heap in the pillar which I have set between you and me? <clears throat> this heap is a witness, and the pillar is a witness, that I will not pass over this heap to you. And you will not pass over this heap to me to do harm. So they're making a promise, they're making a covenant, that they will not do harm to each other. The God of Abraham and the God of Nahor and the God of your father judge between us. So Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac <clears throat> and Jacob offered a sacrifice in the hill country and said, his kinsmen and called his kinsmen to eat bread. They ate bread and spent the night in the hill country. Early in the morning, Laban arose and kissed his grandchildren and his daughters and blessed them. And then Laban departed and returned home. Chapter 32. Um, hold on one second. Give me one second because we have a few more chapters, guys. Okay, chapter 32. So now Jacob is going back home. <clears throat> Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp. So he called the name of that place Mahanaim. Mahanaim. And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother. <clears throat> so Jacob is traveling to go see his brother, and he sees a camp, a whole camp of God's angels. And I'm pretty sure that this probably gave him a lot of confidence to confront his brother Esau. <clears throat> knowing that these men were with him. 
So Jacob, but Jacob still sends messengers ahead, ahead of him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. Because the country of Edom is the country of Esau. Those are the Edomites. <coughs> Instructing them, thus you shall say to my lord Esau, thus says your servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male servants, and female servants. I have sent to tell my Lord in order that I might find favor in your sight. Jacob is um, very nervous about meeting his brother because he wanted to kill him. He still thinks that, that Esau wants to kill him. When, so just as a side note, when, when Jacob says, thus shall you say to my Lord Esau, Jacob was placing himself in a um, subordinate position to Esau by using the common ancient Near Eastern <clears throat> formula, to my Lord whomever say, thus speaks your servant whomever. So that he can sound like he was humbled before Esau as he's approaching. <clears throat> and the messengers returned to Jacob saying, We came to your brother Esau, and he is coming to meet you. And there are 400 men with him. That's it. That's all they told him. And Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. He divided the people who were with him. Now he's freaking out that he's going to divide his family up <clears throat> so they have a fighting chance. <clears throat> he divides the people who were with him, the flocks, the herds, the camels, into two camps, thinking if Esau comes to the one camp and attacks it, then the camp that is left will escape. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, return to your country and to your kindred, that I may do you good. Remember, God promised him. He's the one that told him, go back to your countryside. He said, I am not worthy of the least of all the deeds of steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. For with only my staff, I crossed this Jordan, and now I have become two camps. <clears throat> Please deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him that he may come and attack me and my mo and my mothers and the mothers with children. But you said, see, Jacob is saying the promises of God back to God. He said, but you said, I will surely do good and make your offspring as the sands of the sea, which cannot be numbered for a multitude. So Jacob is fighting here. He's fighting between faith in what God's promises are, faith in what God said, and the reality of having to face his brother whom he feels wants to kill him. Um, <clears throat> so he's fighting between his faith and his flesh. So he stayed there that night, and from what he had with him, he took a present for his brother, <clears throat> Esau. So now he's going to send a present to his brother Esau. 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 milking camels and their calves, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys. He's got a lot of stuff that he wants to give his brother. <clears throat> These he handed over to his servants, every drove by itself, and said to his servants, Pass on ahead of me and put a space between drove and drove. <clears throat> so go ahead of me and put spaces in between each flock. 
And then he instructed him, when Esau, my brother, meets you and asks you, to whom do these belong? Where are you going? And whose are these ahead of you? <clears throat> then you shall say, these belong to your servant, Jacob. They are a present sent to my Lord Esau. And moreover, he is behind us. He likewise instructed the second and the third and all who followed in droves. So each drove was to approach Esau and say, you know, this is for <coughs> a present from our Lord, from our Lord Jacob to, to you, Esau. <clears throat> and he said, you shall say the same thing to Esau when you find him. And you shall say, moreover, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he thought, I may appease him with the present that goes ahead of me. And afterwards, I shall see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. So the present passed on ahead of him. And he himself stayed that night in the camp. <clears throat> So here's kind of a pivotal moment. The same night he arose and took his two wives, the two female servants and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the, of the Jabbok. I don't know what that means. Hold on. Let me just look up this word. <clears throat> oh, okay. I guess that is the word. Um, yeah, so he, he, he gathers his wives and his children, and they, <clears throat> they cross the ford of the, of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had, and Jacob was left alone. So he took them across, he put them across the stream, and now Jacob is by himself. <clears throat> and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled him. Then he said, let me go for the day has broken. <clears throat> so Jacob is continuing to wrestle this being I don't know Rahim I was trying to look it up it said it said the um I don't know what Jabak means it says the ford of the Jabak <clears throat> I'm looking here <clears throat> and to see if there's a definition But I don't see it. You might have to look that up. I'm not sure. <clears throat> so Jacob is continuing to wrestle with this being. Okay. His hip has been taken out of socket and he's still not giving up. But Jacob says, I will not let you go until you bless me. Jacob really strives for the blessing. But Jacob will do anything for the blessing. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. <clears throat> so Jacob wanted to know his name. But notice that the, the angel of the Lord says, I've changed your name to Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. The name Israel, and therefore the, the, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the whole, the whole um, congregation of Israel, because the word Israel means to, to strive with God. 
And this is ultimately our, our purpose. Basically, this is also our process with God, is striving with God. <clears throat> this um, striving with God in a manner that we are getting closer to God. Gina says, Jabbok is a brook in Bashan. Thank you, Gina. It's some type of a brook. <clears throat> okay. Excuse me, I'm having like a lot of issues here. So he says, please tell me your name. So now Jacob wants to know the angel's name. Please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you have asked my name? He never tells him. He just says, why is it that you asked my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face. And yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is in the hip socket because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. So some part of the thigh, um, <clears throat> it there became customary not to eat it because of this reason. So chapter 33, guys. And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau was coming, and 400 men with him. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two female servants, and he put the servants of their children in front, and Leah with their children, and Rachel and Joseph last. So obviously he's putting, in, putting them in order of importance. He's putting the servants and their children ahead. He puts Leah and her children, and then Rachel and Joseph. <clears throat> he himself went on before them, bowing himself to the ground seven times. There's that number seven again. Seven times until he came near to his brother. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. When Esau lifted up his eyes and saw the women and children, he said, who are these with you? And Jacob said, the children whom God has graciously given to your servant. Then the servants drew near, they and their children, and bowed down. Leah likewise and her children drew near and bowed down. And last, Joseph and Rachel drew near and bowed down to Esau. Esau said, what do you mean by all of this company that I meet? Jacob answered, to find favor in the sight of my Lord. But Esau says, I have enough, my brother. <clears throat> Keep what you have for yourself. Jacob said, no, please. If I have found favor in your sight, then accept my present from my hand. For I have seen your face, which is like seeing the face of God. And you have accepted me. Please accept my, my blessing that is brought to you because God has dealt graciously with me <clears throat> and because I have enough. And thus he urged him and he took it. So Esau was like, I have enough of my own. It's okay. Like he just missed his brother. And God knew that, which is why God told him to go back to his countryside. <clears throat> God knew that. That's why you have to trust what God says, because God can see what you can't see. and He can see what's going on. And so he told Jacob, go back to your family. And Jacob was still kind of in fear and he was wrestling with with the promise of what God told him and the flesh of knowing, you know, my brother wants to kill me. Now he's coming with 400 men. <clears throat> but God's promise was true, that he would protect him and everything would go well with him. Then Esau said, let us journey on our way and I will go ahead of you. But Jacob said to him, my Lord knows that the children are frail and that the nursing flocks and herds are a care to me. If they are driven hard for one day, all these flocks will die. Let my Lord pass ahead, ahead of his servant, and I will lead on slowly at the pace of the livestock that are ahead of me and at the pace of the children until I come to my Lord in Seir. So Esau said, let me leave with you some of the people who are with me. But he said, what need is there? Let me find favor in the sight of my Lord. 
So Esau returned that day on his way to Seir, but Jacob journeyed to Sukkot <coughs> and built himself a house and made booths for his livestock. <coughs> Therefore, the name of the place is called Sukkot. So here is the first mention of the name Sukkot because it is called booths. So because Jacob built booths there, he named the place Sukkot. And then later on, we will see, like, during the Exodus, when the children of Israel are in the wilderness, that they are commanded to build, to dwell in booths as well. And God, um, of course, calls it uh, the Feast of Sukkot, dwelling in booths. And Jacob came safely. And the reason for that is because God wants you to remember that he is your provider. When you're dwelling in a booth, you are de it, it, it's a temporary dwelling place. These tents are temporary dwelling places, and you are depending on God to get you from point A to point B safely. <clears throat> and Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, on his way from Padan Haram, and he camped before the city. And he camped before the city, and from the sons of Hamor, Shechem's father, he bought for a hundred pieces of money the piece of land on which he pitched his tent. So he purchased some land from the son of Shechem. There he erected an altar and called it El Elohe Israel. <clears throat> Chapter 34. Now, here we see Dinah. This is where Dinah comes into the picture. This is the daughter of Jacob through Leah. Now, Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had born to Jacob, went out to see the women of the land. So she's going out to mingle with the women, the other females that are in the land of Canaan. Now when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, so now this is not good, guys. Now we're getting into the, <coughs> the Hivites, the Canaanites, all of the ites that are descendants of Canaan. <coughs> When Shechem, the son of Hamor, the, Han the Hivite, the prince of the land, saw her, so now Shechem sees Dinah. He seized her and lay with her and humiliated her. So he basically raped her. So Shechem sees her, uh, wants her, and rapes her. Because this is the way of the land. People did whatever they wanted. If they wanted something, they went after it. If they, if they had to kill for it, they didn't care. You see, <clears throat> and this is why Abraham called Sarah his sister and why Isaac called Rebekah his sister as well. <clears throat> so he rapes her and he is soul, his soul was drawn to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. He loved the young woman and spoke tenderly of her. Oh, isn't that nice? You spoke tenderly of her, but you completely just raped her. So Shechem spoke to his father Hamor, saying, Give me this girl for my wife. Give it to me. I want her. Now Jacob heard that he had defiled his daughter Dinah, but his sons were with his livestock in the field, so Jacob held his peace until they came. And Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. So Jacob... <clears throat> oh, so Hamor is going to go speak to Jacob on his son's behalf to try to get this girl for his son. The sons of Jacob had come in from the field as soon as they heard <clears throat> of what had happened. And the men were indignant and very angry. 
because he had done an outrageous thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter for such a thing must not be done. This was not their custom. Okay, so they're not living like the heathen nations. You just don't do that. <clears throat> okay. But Hamor spoke with them saying, the soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him to be a wife. Make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us and take our daughters for yourselves. You shall dwell with us and the land shall be upon you, to you. I'm sorry, so the land shall be open to you. Dwell and trade in it, get property in it. So they're trying to create this uh, family unit. <clears throat> Shechem also said to her father and to her brothers, let me find favor in your eyes and whatever you say to me, I will give. Ask me for as great a bride price and gift as you will, and I will give you whatever you say to me. Only give me the young woman to be my wife. So there was this thing called a bride price in the Middle East. And in Hebrew, it was called mahor, a payment made by a prospective husband for the bride. Normally, a community in the ancient Near East would have a set price, but in this instance, Shechem was willing to go beyond the set price. So there was a usual price <clears throat> made for a bride, but he's saying, name your amount and I'll give it to you. The sons of Jacob answered Shechem and his father Hamor deceitfully because he had defiled their sister Dinah. They said to them, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised. This is classic like trickery. <clears throat> we can't give our sister to someone who is uncircumcised for that would be a disgrace to us. Only on this condition will we agree with you that you will become as we are by every male among you being circumcised. Sure, then we'll give you her. Then we will give our daughters to you and we will take your daughters to ourselves and we will dwell with you and be one people. But if you will not listen to us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and we will be gone. Their words pleased Hamor <clears throat> and Hamor's son Shechem. And the young man did not delay to do the thing. Wow, he really, really liked Dinah because he was willing to circumcise himself as an adult. <clears throat> now he was the most honored of all his father's house. So Hamor and his son Shechem came to the gate of their city and spoke to the men of their city, saying, These men are at peace with us. Let them dwell in the land and trade in it. For behold, the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters as wives and let us give them our daughters. Only on this condition will these men agree to dwell with us to become one people. They're trying to become one people. <clears throat> When every male among us is circumcised, as they are circumcised, will not their livestock, their property, and all their beasts be ours? So you see here, first Shechem is lusting after Dinah, rapes her, and then his father goes to talk to Jacob, and he sees that they're very wealthy. So now they want to um, become one family with them because now what's theirs will be ours. So it's, they're, they're, they're being deceitful in their reasoning for wanting to create this bond. <clears throat> they just want all of their belongings. Will not their property and all their beasts be ours? Only let us agree with them and they will dwell with us. And all 
who went out of the gate of the city, listened to Hamor and his son Shechem, and every male was circumcised, all who went out of the city of his gate. <clears throat> so they did it. On the third day, when they were sore, so the third day is supposed to be the, the most painful day, like as if day one was not bad enough. Day three, like, is more, is the most painful. Two of the sons of Jacob, Simon and Levi, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, took their swords and came against the city <clears throat> while it felt secure and killed all the males. So they tricked them into circumcising themselves so that they would all be in pain while they came in and killed all of them. It's actually a pretty good idea if you think about it. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem. So they just, they kill him and his father and all the men. They kill Hamor and his son Shechem with the sword and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went away. <clears throat> the sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their flocks and their herds and their donkeys and whatever was in the city and in the field, all their wealth, all their little ones and their wives, all that was in the house, they captured and plundered. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have brought trouble upon me. So Jacob's not happy with how they handled this because now he's fearing that he's going to be in trouble. He says, you have brought trouble on me by making me stink to the inhabitants of the land. The Canaanites, the Perizzites, my numbers are few. And if they gather themselves against me and attack me, I shall be destroyed. In other words, you're not being, you're not thinking, guys, the, you know, we're outnumbered. They're going to kill us. I shall be destroyed, both I and my household. But they said, <clears throat> but now his sons are saying, should he treat our sister like a prostitute? Okay, chapter 35. God said to Jacob, <coughs> Arise and go up to Bethel and dwell there. Make an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household, and to all who were with him, put away your foreign gods. This is what is Jacob saying to his household. Put away the foreign gods that are among you and purify yourselves and change your garments. <clears throat> then let us arise and go up to Bethel so that I may make there an altar to the God who answers me in the day of my distress. And has been with me wherever I have gone. So at this point, Jacob is realizing that God is appearing to him. Anytime that Jacob is fearing for his life, God is appearing to him and telling him what to do. And he's guiding him. God is keeping his promise. So Jacob's getting serious. He's saying, put away all your foreign gods. Cleanse yourselves because we're going back to Bethel. <clears throat> so that I can make an altar there to the God who answers me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods that they had and the rings that were in their ears. Jacob hid them under the terebin tree that was near Shechem. As they journeyed, a terror from God fell upon the cities that were around them. <clears throat> God sent a supernatural terror among the cities that were around them to protect Jacob and his family, even though he was outnumbered. And Jacob came to Luz, or Bethel, he came to Bethel, which was in the land of Canaan. He and all the people who were with him, and there he built an altar and called the place El Bethel because there God had revealed himself to him when he had fled from his brother. And Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, so this was random, 
Rebecca's nurse, Deborah, died and she was buried under an oak below Bethel. So he called its name Alon Bahuth. So apparently Rebecca's nurse and family had now been journeying with him as well. God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padan Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, your name is Jacob. No longer shall your name be called Jacob because Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. And God said to him, I am God, Alm I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you. And kings shall come from your own body. The land that I gave to Abraham and Isaac I will give to you. And I will give the land to the offspring after you. Then God went up from his place in the place where he had spoken with him. <clears throat> and Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken with him. A pillar of stone. And he poured out a drink offering upon it. And poured oil on it. So Jacob called the name of the place. So this is... This is kind of leading up to what's going to be done in the temple. The, the drink offering, which is the wine, the oil offering. This is all part of, this is going to be part of the temple sacrifices. The oil, the wine, and then later on, more animal offerings. So Jacob called the name of the place where God had spoken with him, Bethel. Then they journeyed from Bethel, which they were... Um, then they journeyed from Bethel. When they were still some distance from Ephrat, Rachel went into labor. And she had a hard labor. And when her labor was at its hardest, the midwife said to her, Do not fear, for you have another son. And her soul was departing, for she was dying. Rachel was dying in birth. And she called his name Ben-Oni. But his father called him Benjamin. So she called him a certain name, and then Jacob changes the name to Benjamin. So Rachel died, and she was buried on the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. She was, Rachel was buried in Bethlehem. And Jacob set up a pillar over her tomb, and it is the pillar of Rachel's tomb, which is there to this day. Israel journeyed on. So from this moment on, his name is going, he's going to be referred to as Israel in certain moments and Jacob in certain moments. Israel journeyed on and pinched his tent beyond the tower of Eder. <clears throat> While Israel lived in that land, Reuben went and laid with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard of it. You're not supposed to sleep with your father's wife. Now, this was not his mother, but this was his, still his father's wife, and his oldest son, Reuben, slept with her. Now, the sons of Jacob were 12. The sons of Leah were Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Ishakar, Zebulun, and the sons of Rachel were Joseph and Benjamin. The sons of Bilhah, Rachel's servant, were Dan of Naphtali. The sons of Zilpah, Leah's servant, were Gad and Asher. These were the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Padan Haram. And Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre, which is also Hebron. So now he's coming to his father Isaac in Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had so sojourned. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years, and Isaac breathed his last, and he died and was gathered to his people, old and full of days, and his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. So he makes it in time <clears throat> to see his father, and then finally um, Isaac passes, and Jacob and Esau bury Isaac. <clears throat> All right, guys, chapter 36, this is the last chapter. These are the generations of Esau, that is also called Edom. You will see them referred to as Edomites. And there's a, there's a country called Edom, and that's the, um, the country of Esau. Esau took his wives from the Canaanites. 
Remember, Esau took his wife, his wives from the Canaanites. Ada, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, and Ohelibaba, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zebion the Hivite. So the Hittite and the Hivite. And then Basemath, Ishmael's daughter, the sister of Neboath. And Ada bore to Esau. So basically he had Canaanite daughter uh, wives, and then he also had taken some wives from Ishmael's daughters as well. <clears throat> So Ada bore Esau, Eliphaz, Bazemath bore Ruel, and Ohilaba bore Jeush, Jalam, and Korah. These are the sons of Esau who were born to him in the land of Canaan. Then Esau took his wives, his sons, his daughters, and all the members of his household, his livestock, and all his beasts, and all his property that he had acquired in the land of Canaan, and he went into a land away from his brother Jacob. For their possessions were too great for them to dwell together. So he's moving. The land of their shore sojourning could not support them because of their livestock. So Esau settled in the hill country of Seir, <clears throat> which will later be called the land of Edom. These are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites, in the hill country of Seir. These are the names of Esau's sons, Eliphaz, the sons of Ada, the wife of Esau, Ruel, the son of Basmath, the wife of Esau, and the sons of Eliphaz were Taman, Omar, Zepho, Gatam, and Kenaz. Timna was a concubine of Eliphaz, Esau's son. She bore Amalek to Eliphaz. And you will see later on that the Amalekites come from Amalek and they play a very important role later on. These are the sons of Ada, Esau's wife. These are the sons of Ruel. <clears throat> Nahath, Zerah, Shama, and Miza. These are the sons of Basmath. These are the sons of <clears throat> Ohalamaba, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zebion. She bore to Esau, Jeus, Jalam, and Korah. I know there's a lot of names here, guys, but if you have time when you're reading the Bible, pay attention to the names because later on you're going to see characters come up and you're going to wonder, like, well, who are they? And you want to know where they come from and who they're descended from because it just gives you a bigger picture of what's going on. <clears throat> Um, these are the chiefs of the sons of, Eha, of Esau. The sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn of Esau, the chiefs Taman, Omar, Zelpho, Kenaz, Korah, Gatam, and Amalek. Remember Amalek, because he plays a role. Now, Amalek was the daughter, or the son of Esau and... Ada, which was a Canaanite wife. Okay? So Amalek is half Canaanite. <clears throat> Indeed, a lot of, with the exception of the wife that was from the daughter of Ishmael, the sons that came, the, the, the sons and daughters that came from the two Canaanite wives. <clears throat> um, they're all half Canaanite, and those are Esau's descendants. These are the sons of Seir, the Horites, the inhabitants of the land. Lotan, Shobal, Zimeon, Anna, Dishon, Ezer, Dishon. These are the chiefs of the Horites, the sons of Seir in the land of Edom. The sons of Lotan are Horai, the Hemam, and Latan's sister was Timna. These are the sons of Shobal, Alvan, Manahath, Ebal, Shepho, and Onam. These are the sons of Zibion. 
Aya, Anna, and he is the Anna who found the hot springs in the wilderness as he pastured the donkeys of Zebion, his father. These are the children of Anna, Dishon, Odiaba, the daughter of Anna. And these are the sons of Dishon, Hemna, Eshban. Okay, so we're going through all of the names of the descendants of Esau. And there's a reason why there's a whole chapter. The entire chapter 36 is dedicated to this so that you know who these people are later on <clears throat> and where they come from. Okay, so we're going to skip down. Um, <clears throat> Dishon, Ezer, and Dishon... These are the chiefs of the Horites, chief by chief in the land of Seir. These are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before any king ever reigned over the Israelites. So the Edomites set up kings in, in their land before the Israelites set up kings in their land. <clears throat> Bala, the son of Baor, reigned in Edom. The name of his city being Dinhaba. Bala died, and Jobah, the son of Zerah of Bozrah, reigned in his place. Jobab died, and Husham of the land of the Temanites reigned in his place. Husham died, and Hadad, son of Bedad, who defeated Midian in the country of Moab. And you'll see that this all ties into the extra biblical texts as well. You can find it in Jasher and you can find it in the more reliable source, the book of Jubilees. He who defeated Midian in the country of Moab. So you had the Edomites kind of warring with the Moabites and the Midianites. And the Moabites were the descendants of Lot. The Midianites were descendants of the second wife of Abraham, Keturah. Reigned in his place, the name of his city was Af Abith. Hadad died, and Samla of Meshreka reigned in his place. Samla died, and Shaul of Rehoboth on the Euphrates reigned in his place. Shaul died, and Baal Hanan, the son of Akbor. Akbor. That sounds very Arabic, doesn't it? Reigned in his place. Baal Hanan, I'm sorry, Baal Hanan, the son of Akbor, died, and Hadar reigned in his place, and the name of his city being Pau. His wife's name was Mehatabel, and the daughter of Matred, the daughter of Mezahab. These are the names of the chiefs of Esau, according to their clans and their dwelling places. By their names, the chiefs Timnah, Alav, Jehath. <clears throat> okay, so these are all the chiefs of Edom, according to their dwelling places in the land of their possession. So chapter 36 is the entire genealogy of Esau and the Edomites, which is going to be important later on. And all of these things are important because you, if you ever want to know where they went over historic, you know, in history, you want to be able to refer back to the names because that's when you can find out who they descended from and where they came from. Okay, guys, so that is the end of our Bible reading. Um, I know there was a lot of information there. Um, I think the most important thing for me, this is just this is just my takeaway. To me, the most important thing in these chapters <clears throat> is seeing God cultivate this relationship with Jacob as he did with Isaac and as he did with Abraham and keeping his promise. Like God made a promise, God made a covenant covenant with him to, to keep him safe. And you see, every time Jacob was in distress, God was there to tell him where to go and what to do, and he kept him safe. God was keeping his, God is a promise keeper. When God makes a covenant and makes a promise to you, and you know it was God that said it, you can take it to the bank. God is going to keep his promises, and God is going to 
keep you in such a way that this promise can come true. Like if God tells you you're going to be, you know, president of the United States and you're like a bum on the side of the street, it doesn't matter. God is going to to keep you in such a way and give you favor in such a way that those promises come true. Yes, Rahim, he kept his promise. And this is this is very important because this is like the foundation of our relationship with God. And I mean our real relationship with God. And I and I'm and I'm just going to speak for me personally, but when God um when I first started walking with God, that's when God spoke like the most. God still speaks, but I but it's almost like just like it was in the book like in the book of Exodus when God was bringing the children of Israel out. That's when God did all these miracles. That's when God was like speaking to them constantly in the wilderness. But then when they get to the promised land, it's almost like God kind of lets them do their thing. And I feel like that's what God does with us. I know that that's what God did with me personally. Like, let me know what your experience was. Like, I would love to hear, like, how, how did it, how did it transpire for you? But I know for me, like, the beginning, the first few years of me really walking with God, God was speaking very loud. God was making promises during that time. God was speaking prophecy over me for my life, my personal life during that time. And he was he was making it himself very known and he was keeping those promises so you can know that God's word is true. And <clears throat> this is part of this relationship process that we have with God and we can see that he did the same things with the patriarchs as well. You know, he's this is a God that's coming out of nowhere and he's like introducing himself to them and he says, look, I'm going to keep my promises to you. Okay? And he, he, he did. He kept them with every single one of them. Everything that God said came to pass. And this is another way that God proves himself. It's, I, I want to say he proves himself to you, but it, 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 it's, it's like introducing himself to you and so that you know that he is the God that he says that he is. He is going to keep his, he's going to make promises to you that he keeps. He's going to protect you. He's going to fulfill, you know, <clears throat> prospering you and protecting you and keeping you safe. And then he's also going to, um, you know, give you promises, like almost like little prophecies that you have to wait to see fulfilled. And then you see them fulfilled and you're like, oh my God, like this could have only been God. And he did the same thing with the patriarchs. Christine says, me too. He spoke so strong for me. Like he was right beside me telling me how to keep my healing and not die from trusting the wrong people with my health. Yes. As soon as I listened, he let me just enjoy my growth. He even told me my biggest issue I had in my life was <clears throat> life that stumped me from living out his promises. Yes. And that's so funny that you were having health issues at the time that God was speaking the most because that was the same thing with me. Like I was it was when I first started walking with God that God led me to the people or the place that I needed to be to heal me from what I was having issues with or what I was suffering from at the time. <clears throat> and so that's so amazing. Like you come to God and he's like, I'm going to heal you. I'm going to take care of you. Don't worry. I got you. Like, I'm going to, I'm going to prosper you. You just have to follow me. I'm speaking promises over you and you might see them in two years. You might see them in five years. You might see some of them in 10 years. Um, just depends on how it's going to turn out. And it's just amazing because this is how God starts his relationship with us. <clears throat> and it does seem like as we're kind of like getting the hang of it, he kind of steps back a little and he's not speaking as much because we're, we, we kind of have a pattern down kind of like a parent does with a child. When, when, when our, when the child is little, we're like over them, we're watching them and we're, we're, you know, when they're very young, you're, you're like, you, you can't take your eyes off of them. If you take your eyes off of them for two seconds, poof, they're, you know, they're in a, they're in a mischief <clears throat> or they can hurt themselves. So we're hovering over them through their younger years. And as they get older, you kind of step back and you let them be their, their own person because you have, 
You have poured yourself so much into them that you feel a part of you is in them and can sustain them. The part of you that you have poured into your children, the part of God that he has poured into us, he feels like can sustain us and can sustain our relationship with him. So he kind of steps back and lets us be more adults and make more of our own decisions. And of course, he's always there, but he's, and he's still guiding us. He's just not as, it's not as loud and obvious as in the beginning, because that's what we need it the most, because that's when we're, we're, it's new, you know? So I always thought that was interesting. And I see that happen with almost every believer I've ever met. Like that beginning stage is like, oh my gosh, God was speaking so loud and so clear and he was doing miracles and he was, you know, prophesying and, and these promises were coming true. And it's like, wow, and God's just blowing your mind. Christine said, yep, um, <clears throat> I was put on 90s chemo drugs and brutal painkillers. The chemo was injections. He told me to listen to him and that my issues had always been Listening to people in the world around me reminded me that my life was of in this flesh and blood and to use my food as medicine. Yes. Then led me to someone who puts blood under a microscope and took at what's hap and looks at what's happening to your body on a cellular level. I am pain free mostly when I was almost crippled. Oh my goodness. See, that's that is totally God, and that is something that He will do. That is, that's amazing. That's a wonderful story. I love that testimony. It's actually um, <clears throat> very, very, very similar to what was going on with me. I was not put on chemo drugs, um, but I was suffering a lot. I've been suffering from childhood. And God was telling me, <clears throat> don't listen to the doctors because every doctor I went to didn't know what the heck they were talking about, couldn't find what was wrong, didn't know what was going on. And God said, God literally brought me to the right places <coughs> that I could have never known on my own. And I ended up being healed. So it's, it's, it's amazing. So, you know, sometimes God, you know, when we get into the like pray for healing, pray for healing, sometimes it's not just praying for God to, you know, magically heal you. Sometimes it's just praying for God to send the right people or send the right places into your life so that, um, so that you're, you're guided through those, those people and those places. Uh, so that's amazing. I'm so glad you, I'm so glad you were willing to, to, to tell that, to tell that story. He really is amazing. If you just stop and listen and follow and yep, I suffered my whole life too. Doctors left me to get sicker and woohoo for you girl too. Yeah, it's unbelievable. You can't put your trust in men. You have to listen to God because Modern medicine has so many flaws. God knows what's going on inside of your body. He can see what's happening, exactly what's happening. So <clears throat> I just think that's amazing. The sort of this way that God has with formulating this, establishing this relationship with us and keeping his promises and, 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 and getting us to a place that we're, that we're um, <clears throat> sufficient to, to sort of, sort of walk instead of crawl, if that makes sense. And, um, it's a beautiful thing. It really is a beautiful thing. Guys, it has been two hours and you are awesome for sticking around this long. I love it. I just, I'm glad that you were able to, to, to make it, even though I changed the time. I think I changed the time in the day, like five times. I think I changed the time five times and then I changed the day and the time. Um, and I apologize for that. I hope to be back on here next Shabbat. I wish I could do a video during the week. I really do. I just, I just pray that God, maybe you can stand in agreement with me that God will somehow change my circumstances. I have to drive an hour to work. I have to drive an hour back. So that's two hours every day that I'm just driving. And then, you know, I come home and I cook and we have to eat and then we, you know, just stuff around the house. We have a garden now. We have a serious garden that we're trying to be very serious with. Like we're trying to grow a lot of food. <laughs> like, like our lives depend on it because you never know it. 
it may one day, gosh, with everything that's going on. Um, and it's really fun. I just, you know, if I, I encourage you, if you can grow anything, um, you can grow almost anything from the produce that you get at the store. <clears throat> um, I encourage you to do it. It's very therapeutic. It brings me so much joy. And I feel like I just want more time to do this. But I can't because I work a full-time job. I'm actually trying to slow down my, my side business because of time. Like time, you can't buy time. You can't create time. So what do you do? You know, so I've tried to slow down my side business so that I can have more time for Keys to the Kingdom because ultimately this is where my heart is and this is, um, uh, you know, what I love. And so I just want to just pray that God will... I don't know how he will somehow miraculously make it to where I have more time. How that will be, only God knows, but he's really good at stuff like that. So I'm going to leave it in his hands. Thank you, Raheem. Thank you. Thank you for standing in agreement with me. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Christine. Time is time, and when you make it, it works. It will be here it will be here for God and his word. Thank you so much. <clears throat> um, yes, you, yes, when you get moved, you should start your garden. That would be great. Thank you, Gina. I appreciate you praying. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I want more time to invest. I want to be able to invest more time in Keys to the Kingdom because um, that's where my heart is. And it's not that I don't want to work. I just don't want to, I don't know. I don't know. I feel like, I don't know. Maybe, maybe a new season is, maybe a new season is coming. I'm going to say this out loud and let's just maybe remember this in case something happens sometime soon within the next year. Maybe a new season is coming because I have been at this job for seven years and I'm telling you right now, God works in my life in sevens. In the big things, he works in sevens. So I'm, I'm coming up in February <clears throat> on my seven-year anniversary at my job. It's very possible that I'm about to go into a new season. Sometimes I can just feel it in my spirit that God is getting me ready for a new season. <sighs> And that's when I get excited and a little bit nervous because I never know what he has in store. Sometimes he tells me a little bit. Does God ever do that with you? Like he'll tell you this much and you're like, okay, what about the rest? Like he gives you like a small sentence and you're like, can you, can you, you know, <laughs> where's the rest of that sentence? I would like to know. So, um, who knows? Maybe that's, maybe that's what he has in the cards. God's willing. Um, but again, I'm so grateful that you guys were able to stick it out for two hours. I hope to see you guys next Shabbat, God's willing, sometimes next weekend. I will let you know um, one way or another with the event, with the event invite. Um, so I hope to see you then. I hope you have a great week. Maybe I'll do a video during the week. We shall see. In the meantime, God bless you and have a wonderful evening.